In 1907, a farmer had a brilliant idea. Using a concrete pipe, he redirected steam from a nearby hot spring into his home in order to heat it. In the 1930s, the first major development in geothermal heating began in Reykjavik. A pipeline was constructed in order to bring geothermal heating to buildings throughout the city. And today, 90% of the heating in Iceland comes from geothermal energy. Much in the way that your home will have an electric cable that connects you to the grid, or a pipe that connects you to your neighborhood's water supply. If you live in Iceland, you will probably also have a pipe that provides you with geothermal heated water. Welcome to my Icelandic bathroom, everybody. So uh, I'm staying at a cabin right now that is located on a area of geothermal activity and they are using the activity on their property to both heat their home and uh, provide hot water for their home. So how I understand it is that if you are lucky enough to have that sort of activity on your property, you can use it for your home. And if you have a lot of it, you can actually share that power with other people in your neighborhood. And if you have like a ton of activity, like it's really just like blowing up underneath you, then you can even have uh, a generator brought in and you can use that energy for electricity. So uh, down here, we've got a, uh, what do you call it, sink, you know, sink. And if you put the hot water on, it gets very, very hot. Like that water will get boiling. <laughs> very quickly. This smells like eggs. It's got a sulfuric smell to it. And if you are staying at a place in Iceland, you may notice that uh, your water smells like eggs. Guess what? You are using water that is heated by geothermal activity. I believe it's actually not okay to drink that water. Uh, you can drink the cold water. The cold water is coming from a different source. The cold water is, is fantastic, and if you turn the cold water on, you don't really smell eggs so much, but when you switch it over to the hot, you start smelling that, that smell. So the good thing with this is if you have like a bathtub, that bathtub will heat up real fast, real hot. Uh, you might smell like a hard-boiled egg afterwards, but um, it is, it is kind of nice. So that's the hot water. The heating is done through pipes. So you can kind of see a good example of it here. The place I'm staying at has a uh, towel rack that is heated up with geothermal power. That steam coming from the hot water under the ground and through a system of pipes that is brought up through uh, these pipes here. And this is like a shutoff valve for it, but if you open it up like it is right now, uh, this thing gets hot. So if you put your wet towel on this thing, you know, give it, you know, 20 minutes and it's going to be completely dry. And yeah, this is hot because it is full of steam. Maybe it's hot water, but it is, either way, it's, it is heated by the earth, which is really, really neat. And in the kitchen here, it's the same sort of deal. The, uh, the hot water there, it smells like eggs when you put on the hot water. So that is geothermal heated water. And uh, the radiators here also have that. It's, it's the same exact sort of setup, but uh, instead of heating a towel, it heats up the room. And uh, it, it works really well. Throughout the country, you will see these big pipes running along the side of the road. That is the, uh, the hot water coming from areas where they are bringing up hot water from the ground, or it's from a power plant but they convert that energy into electricity that is being used to light people's homes. But then also the hot water that is left over from the steam gets funneled out and that hot water is used then to heat people's homes and to give uh, hot water out of their water taps. Heating, hot water, 
cooking, electricity, towel racks. These are the big uses for geothermal energy. However, there are a lot of other uses that don't get spoken about quite so much. So let's talk about them, or at least briefly. Some small but interesting uses for geothermal energy are Number one, heated sidewalks and streets. Networks of pipes are installed under sidewalks, streets, and in parking lots in order to prevent ice. In Reykjavik, there are 50 square kilometers of this system installed throughout the city. In a country that can have harsh winters with low visibility, this can literally be a lifesaver. Number two, drying food. Geothermal energy is used in order to dry things. It's most commonly used in Iceland to dry out fish and also pet food. Number three, regulating the temperature for fish breeding. Yep. Number four, carbon dioxide production. CO2 can be extracted from some sources of geothermal liquid and that can be used to carbonate drinks. And there's probably more, but uh, yeah, that, that's enough of that. Okay, I think we're finally ready to put all of the pieces together. Much like how the hot water coming from the earth can be used to heat a room, it also can be used to heat a greenhouse. Before we get into geothermal greenhouses, let's first talk a bit about how a regular greenhouse works. A basic greenhouse is constructed with clear or translucent panels. Sunlight passes through those panels and the heat from that light is absorbed into the interior of the greenhouse. All the stuff that's inside that greenhouse starts to warm up, but the heat that is coming off of that stuff now gets caught by those panels. Therefore, the heat exits slower than it enters, which causes the greenhouse to get warmer and warmer. Depending on where you live, this might not be enough especially if you're trying to grow something tropical in an area that isn't. More advanced greenhouses use ventilation, insulation, coolers, and heaters in order to regulate the temperature. All right. Your typical greenhouse heater looks something like this. They are usually electric or gas powered, and they blow hot air in order to help it circulate. The geothermal heated greenhouses in Iceland look a little bit different. This is actually a really, really nice day. Nice blue skies. It's the, the warmest day that I've, uh, I've had so far here in Iceland. And it's about uh, 12 degrees Celsius. But inside this greenhouse here, oh, it is. <laughs> It is nice and toasty in here. Like this is real warm. This is maybe it, like 30 degrees Celsius. Right. So here we have a system of pipes which uh, no one understands. Okay, good. Yeah. You not, not even the guy himself who put it up, I think. This house, like all greenhouses that are supposed to be kept hot during the winter time and the whole year actually in Iceland, is dependent on geothermal energy. The pipes are maintaining the, the, the temperature and the heat in this house. Here on the campus we have our own drill holes, which uh, we need to maintain pressure on so all the houses here in the area get the warm water. Uh, we need to have constant pressure 
especially in the winter time, or it will be too cold and the plants might not survive that. When the steam is coming in, in the beginning, where the drill hole is, mm -hmm. uh, they need to get it to change into water. But this is where the water is coming in. We need to uh, get some water in a spare tank. The pressure drops. Mm -hmm. It's good to have a spare tank to be able to try and maintain the system. The green one here in the back, what we're using as a preheater as well. If it's cooling mm -hmm. down, we can maintain the temperature. So this is the uh, where the network range is at. Yeah. So a lot of people stand here and scratch their heads, even yeah. plumbers, which are supposed to be professional in this. It can't be a problem for guys with not enough experience. Okay. So this, you get somebody that's yeah. used to a different sort of system, yeah. they come here and they're like, uh... And even me, which, I, well, I've been working here for quite some time, and mm. I am my profession is being a horticulturist. Right. So I get a professional to come and fix my system. Right. Right. Yeah. And also, it's very wise that you may be working with uh, water at around 100 degrees. Sure. Yeah. It's not quite right. It's here. Not cool to get You're not here to be a plumber. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and but if you made a mistake, it might be, you might get a serious burn. Uh -huh. But it's good to have a little bit basic understanding, of course, uh, mm -hmm. for electricity, for plumbing. Yeah, I think it could be good to have all those experience combined when you're working in a greenhouse. So that network of pipes leads here and connects off through this system here. And that goes throughout this entire greenhouse. Several of them are up running along the ceiling, and then there's these long rows going through the aisles here, all heating these plants. And because of that, these guys are getting enough heat to survive. Oh boy, we only have one more episode left in this series about the Icelandic banana and uh, other things. So if you have been watching so far, thank you for, for sticking along. <laughs> and uh, usually, you know, in the end screens, like this one right here, I've been giving previews of what the next episode will involve. Uh, this time, I'm not going to. Uh, if the next episode is up, there will be a link over here. Click that link to go to the final episode. If there is no link there, that means I forgot about it, or it's not out yet, in which case you should click the subscribe button, notification button, etc. Again, I would like to give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. If you're interested in joining Patreon, now is the time. There's a ton of extra content about this series of the Icelandic banana. I'd like to also give a thank you to the Agricultural University of Iceland again. Uh, there's going to be more information about them in the description below. And if you'd like to learn more about this topic, I've also put some other sources in the description below as well. So uh, check that out, and I will see you in the last part very soon.